Good morning, everybody. Morning and happy St. Patrick's Day. Do you like our lights? Look, I more look. I wore green. Julie wore green. There we go. Good to see you this morning. Let's stand together. We've got a great service, an exciting service ahead for us. So let's stand. We'll pray, and then we'll worship together. Father, thank you for every blessing you pour out upon us. We thank you in this St. Patrick's Day that we can celebrate your love for us. Father, we ask you for your strength as we come to worship you. We ask you, Lord, for your anointing as we lift our voices to remind ourselves of your constant care for us, your mercy for us, your provision for us. So, Father, thank you for everything you do for us in Jesus' name. I'm leaning on your everlasting arms So close to you that I can hear your heart Nothing else can separate me from your love I'm leaning on your everlasting arms In the morning I am met with your mercy In the evening I am right your love there's no end to your reach there's no place I'd rather be I'm leaning on your everlasting arms I'm resting in your never ending peace patiently I wait to hear you speak nothing else can keep me safe from every Nothing but your everlasting heart In the morning I am met with your mercy In the evening I am wrapped in your love There's no end to your reach There's no place I'd rather be I'm leaning on your everlasting heart In the morning in the morning, I am met with your mercy. In the evening, I am wrapped in your love. There's no end to your reach. There's no place I'd rather be. I'm leaning on your everlasting heart. I'm resting. I'm resting in your never-ending.
everlasting arms. Let's sing that by the goodness of God.
Some announcements. We just thank you for the team that have already led us in such lovely worship. Um, it's lovely to see all of you here this morning. For anyone that's visitors, you're very welcome. I know that there is some here this morning specifically to hear um, Professor Burgess this morning, and we just pray that you'll be blessed. And if you're listening online, we also pray that you're blessed. So, some announcements for this week. As um, Andy has already said, today is St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm not feeling very patriotic because I've got no green on me this morning. Um, so the announcements this week, general announcements, it says there's prayer, but there's no prayer tomorrow. Um, there's no brew and bowls. I'm not sure about the Pilates, um, but you can see if Aileen is, Pilates is on. Lindsay says Pilates is on. You're not getting any good excuse to get out of it. Um, but no brew and bowls, no prayer meeting tomorrow because it is a, a bank holiday and church and all is closed. Tuesdays, Tiny Tots, Wednesdays, growing together from 6 to 8 for the children's age. Um, Thursday is um, for those that are learning English as a second language. I can't remember what all that means, but that's what that means. <laughs> um, then next week again, we have um, Sunday morning service preceded by coffee and tea at half past 10 and prayer in the prayer room at 10 o'clock. Um, there's no Bible study this week because um, Brian and Mary are still on their holidays. And then next week we have worship night, and I think it's starting at 8 o'clock um, next. Is it, no, half 7. It's half 7, isn't it? 8 o'clock. It is 8 o'clock, yeah, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's starting at 8 o'clock next Tuesday night, but that's not this week, that's the following week. Um, and there are an off there's an offering basket at the back, and for anyone that gives online, and for anyone that puts in the basket, we're, we're thankful for that as well. Um, certainly, if you want to do direct debit on that, you can see Lindsay at the end of the service. Um, and we're going to head back into the team for another worship song. Thank you. Yeah, 
think that the King of Kings would die for us. Just think of that for a second. He left heaven's throne and heaven's glory because of that such love. He was willing, even though his heart didn't really want to because he knew what was before him, as he was in Gethsemane and he said, not my will. He didn't really want to do it. He knew the pain that it was gonna cause. He knew the suffering that he was gonna have. And yet he chose not his will, but his father's will. And why? Because they have such love for us. If you don't know Jesus this morning, as your personal saviour. If you don't know that such love, don't leave it to another day. Before the service is open over today, give your heart to him. Experience his love. Okay, you may be seated. That's my little preach over for this morning. You shouldn't give me a microphone. So just a few more announcements. Um, if I could have the lights on, because I can't see anybody. That's great, and then I'd be squinting, and then people would be shouting at me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a few announcements just before you go. Next Sunday, as I said, there will be Sunday service. It is also Palm Sunday, and after, well, not after Palm Sunday, but Palm Sunday starts the start of the um, Holy Week across all of Christian circles, and um, we are going to have that week starting on the Monday um, and following right through to Friday, a time of prayer every single day. Um, one of the rooms at the back, um, just behind the um, desk when you come into the reception area, will be open and there will be prayer from 11 to 12, Monday to Friday of Holy Week. Um, just to prepare our hearts, just to come to the Lord, be thankful for what his sacrifice actually meant for us. Um, pray for your family, pray for your country, wherever that country may be, where you can pray for your adopted country if you're here and this isn't your home country, you can pray for your home country or you can pray for whichever you want. Um, but it's just, just, just a time of reflection and um, putting time aside every day in that holy week. Um, and then on the Friday night to finish that holy week, on Good Friday, there will be a barbecue, a night filled with song and puppets and it's going to be fun, food, and faith. Now, we know normally the last Friday in the month is normally for community here within our church. But this Friday night on the 29th of um, March, it will be definitely for community. So you, all of the community events will be invited as well. But there will definitely be a very godly um, influence because it is Good Friday. And we're not ashamed of the gospel. And we want to proclaim it. And that is what the church started the work in community for, so that we could minister into, into the community and to those that are lost around us. So please feel free to, um, to come to bring friends. And as always, um, there's going to be food, so you do need to sign up so they can make arrangements for the food. Now, we're going to um, ask the children to leave. And um, so I'm not sure who's gone out with the children this morning. Lorraine and Grace are both going out this morning and um, so children up for Sunday school um, crash is through here as normal and there'll be somebody on crash and we know that um, Mr. Neil Seeds is also going out this morning he is from Answers in Genesis he's going out with our children and going to speak to our children and bring the, the creation message in a way that our children in Sunday school can understand and we're going to ask um, and invite um, Professor Stuart Burgess up to the front this morning and give him the mic. Um, I can't see where he's sitting even though there you are. Um, so yeah, a big warm welcome to him. Um, we know um, Professor Burgess is um, a professor of engineering and he has um, painted and, um, a few different things and I'm sure he'll share that as he brings um, all about creation and the design of God in it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for uh, the warm welcome. It's always good to be in Ireland. I want to show you this morning about uh, God's care for mankind, his love for mankind, and the way he's designed the whole world. 
I have about 40 years of experience in designing, designing for the European Space Agency and also for the British Olympic cycling team. And as an expert in design, when I look at the world, it's incredible how I can see in every detail God's goodness, God's love for man and God's care for man. Very much in keeping with the songs you've had uh, this morning, so a very good selection of songs. The, uh, one of the motivations for this talk is actually designing a, a, an Olympic bicycle. It's a very difficult thing to do. To my surprise, one of the hardest things about designing an Olympic bike is m keeping the riders happy. It's very hard uh, to keep Laura Trott happy and Jason Kenny and uh, all the other riders because not only does every single dimension of the bike have to be just perfect for their arms and legs and hands and their bottom, but also that they're, they're really worried how the bike sounds and any little noises, and they, they hear everything, and the vibrations of the bike, how it deforms, that was the hardest thing to keep the riders happy. So you need this what's called perfect ergonomics. It was the hardest thing. But when I look at the world, I see the whole world is perfectly ergonomically designed for man. In fact, a horse is even better than an Olympic bicycle. Did you know the horse was designed specifically for human use, the back of the horse to sit on, the size of the horse, the power of a horse. Today we take things for granted because we have motor cars and heavy diggers, but in years past, people were so thankful to God for giving them the gift of the horse. And God even designed the horse to enjoy working for people. But it's not just the horse, it's every single detail of creation I want to run through and just give you an overview of God's goodness in designing the world for man. Just right at the start, I want to mention Bible verses because when you go through the Bible, there are many verses that actually teach what I've just been explaining in the book of Isaiah. In chapter 45, it says, the Lord created the earth to be inhabited. He didn't create it in vain. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to design a home uh, for your family, if you've ever had a chance to do that. It's, it's an exciting thing to do, and you put care and attention into it. But that's what God has done with the world. He's designed it with care and attention. Every need of man, he's, he's seen to. In Psalm 104, it says, God has uh, created the food, and the, the earth brings forth food for man. Thank you very much. And... In Psalm 8, it says, what is man that you are mindful of him? When I read that verse, what I, what I read in it is that God has been mindful of every need. The building materials we would need, the food we would need, the clothing we would need, the atmosphere we would need. God has been mindful of every tiny detail, and I'll try to illustrate that. And in Job, it says, God draws up drops of water, which he drops abundantly on man, especially if you live in Ireland. Uh, so when we think of the water cycle, the water cycle is designed for man. That's why it rains, so that people uh, can, can drink and use water. Last week I was in Germany and I was speaking in some schools and I had a, a class of students, they're, they're very good students, and I said to them, what do you think is the main purpose of grass, like meadow grass, the grass we have in our garden? And the students were very good. They said, well, it's, uh, it can produce oxygen through photosynthesis and it could be food for cows. It's also a beautiful color, good background color for flowers. That was a very, very good answer from the students. But I kept pushing them and I said, okay, they, these are all good answers, but, but what's the number one reason God created grass because because we live in an atheistic society we don't really think what is the ultimate purpose of these things and eventually the students got it and someone said the grass is designed for people for gardens to play sport especially golf and rugby that honestly i think that is the the main reason for grass that we can have beautiful grass to make beautiful golf courses and gardens. We often 
forget the ultimate purpose of these things is for mankind. And the same goes for every detail of creation. Uh, of course, I should say congratulations on winning the rugby yesterday. Um, apologies that England didn't quite let you get the Grand Slam. So I'm going to go through a few details where we see God's goodness and care for man. Just starting with the, the solar system, I won't go into details, but scientists are amazed at how the solar system is so perfect for life on Earth. The distance of the Earth from the sun, uh, the, the circular orbits, the rotation of the Earth. It's not just right for stable weather and for the right heat. 24-hour day is just right for sleep, despite what your teenage children might tell you. It is actually perfect for sleep. Um, previously, I designed satellites to go around uh, the Earth. It's very difficult to get a circular orbit. You have to have precision motors to do that. But it just so happens the Earth has virtually a perfect circular orbit around the sun. Some people say that's a coincidence, but I think and I know it's God's design uh, to give us a, a wonderful place to live. 20 years ago, uh, atheists said, we're starting to discover planets around other suns and, and other parts of the Milky Way galaxy and even other galaxies. And they made a prediction 20 years ago. They said, we will show that the Earth is not special. Now, in the last 20 years, they've discovered thousands of what's called extrasolar planets, planets in distant suns. And the conclusion after 20 years is the opposite to what the atheists predicted. They have proven the Earth is absolutely special and unique. 20 years ago, some Christians, I think, were a little worried, uh, but now it's been an absolutely clear uh, conclusion. If, if you're interested, you can look up this kind of scientific paper where uh, atheists are admitting the Earth is indeed very, very special. Uh, the Earth has this angle of tilt that you probably heard of, and uh, a wonderful moon stabilizes the orbit of the Earth and gives us our seasons. Uh, physicists are just amazed at the clockwork motion of the whole universe, which reveals God's wisdom and his care for man. But then when we look at the Earth itself, we see incredible details of design. We have this beautiful atmosphere around the Earth. We can take it for granted here, but when astronauts go into space, they look down at this beautiful blue planet, which has just the right uh, atmosphere. We take the air for granted. It's something which is invisible, but it has exactly the right properties for life. The atmosphere is like a thermal blanket to keep the Earth warm, but it has the right amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide, all the right properties for life. The Earth has incredible ideal lighting. On the one hand, our air is completely transparent so we can see each other, and yet God can give air a color. We, we can have a blue sky and a colorful sunset. God is a genius that he can do both things, have this clear air and yet give it the most beautiful uh, colors. Air has just the right amount of oxygen uh, to breathe. Air has perfect acoustic properties so that we can hear uh, each other. It's very good for transmitting uh, smells. And I think God was thinking how you would put your washing in the garden and how the air, the wind would blow on it and the air would dry your washing. God has thought of every tiny detail in your life, what you would need. And he has designed the air to do all those multiple uh, functions. It's very difficult to design a system that can do so many different things, but God does that in so many ways. Um, if NASA ever put an advert out, uh, would you like to be an astronaut to go to Mars? Do not apply for it and do not try to go for it. Uh, not only would it be a very dangerous journey traveling in something smaller than a telephone box for a year to get there, but when you get there, it's 95% carbon dioxide and freezing temperatures, uh, not a place uh, to live. 
And, but in comparison, you see how wonderful the earth is to live on. Now, water looks so simple. Another one of these things that we take for granted. Uh, such a simple thing, but it's not simple at all. Scientists are absolutely astounded at the design of water. Water is transparent, tasteless, odorless, doesn't smell. But it didn't have to be that way. It could have had a smell and a color. Imagine what it would be like in the morning if you had a shower in purple, smelly uh, water. But God knew that we needed this refreshing, clear water. How we just take it for granted. But it didn't have to be that way. That's God's care, God's love, God's goodness. And if you ever do look at the fine details, water is incredible. It has this cohesion that holds together. It's also a very strong solvent, ideal for cooking because it can uh, dissolve lots of different substances. Then it produces beautiful hexagonal snowflakes and even uh, the ice floats on water, which really uh, astonishes scientists because other substances don't do that, uh, which is important for life in, in, the, in the lakes and the seas around the world. So it's a marvel of design. I won't go through this in detail, but biologists are amazed at the properties of water. It, it has the right heating and cooling and flow viscosity properties, makes it ideal for blood to get round the body. It keeps the body a stable temperature because water keeps things in a stable temperature. And also it can carry oxygen. And so you see water fine-tuned for life. There are so many details where water is perfect for life. And just to show you some interesting contrasts, showing what a clever designer God is. On the one hand, as I said, water is transparent. But on the other hand, God can bring out every color of the rainbow in water when there's moisture in the air and the sun shines on it. So it's clear, but God can give it every color. On the one hand, water is a very strong uh, substance for dissolving other substances, very powerful. But on the other hand, water is completely safe to shower in. Uh, and just one more interesting contrast. On the one hand, oxygen and hydrogen are extremely explosive. But if there's a fire, what do you put those uh, fires out with? With water, which is exactly the same two substances, oxygen and hydrogen. So God is a, is a complete genius the way he can make such a simple substance do these different things. Uh, I lecture on engineering design and I try to see, teach students how to do this kind of multifunctioning. But engineers can never begin to match God's genius in producing all these multiple uh, functions in one substance. So water, it's ideal for cooking. It boils at the right temperature. It freezes at the right temperature. It's ideal for washing, for drinking. And God also designed it for sports, for, for skiing, for those other things. God was thinking of every need of man when he designed water. The next time you have a glass of water, don't take it for granted. Thank God for what he has given and designed. Even rocks, you know, rocks, uh, and, and you have some lovely rocks in Ireland, the Mourne Mountains and other places, even rocks are designed for the use of man, for building materials. And God has given us the perfect range of rocks for all our building needs to create cement, bricks. God has even given us slate where you bash slate and you automatically get convenient tiles for the roofs of your houses. So God has given us beautiful rocks, convenient rocks. It's not a coincidence that we can make glass out of sand uh, and we can make colored glass and all these other types of bricks and beautiful marble. It's not a coincidence. God has designed every detail in that supply of materials. Uh, carbon 
is uh, another really interesting uh, material. For the Tokyo Olympics, I designed carbon chain rings uh, for the bicycles. We were the first team in the world to use carbon fiber for the gears and the chains. Um, other teams thought it wouldn't be good for the, for the shear stresses and the, the chain, but it actually worked really, really well. An amazing thing about carbon fiber or and carbon, on the one hand, carbon can be the softest, blackest, dirtiest material with, you know, the pencils with like a 3B or a 4B uh, softness. It just, it's black and it falls to pieces. But the same carbon in a tiny different structure becomes the hardest, the most beautiful material on earth, diamond. And it has this tiny change in the structure. God is a genius how he can get one material and produce the complete opposite type of properties uh, in. Then we think of God's supply of metal. I've used all of these metals in my 40 years of engineering. God has supplied every kind of metal you need for every kind of application. So if you want soft uh, uh, metal for the guttering of a church, God has given lead. It's, it's a wonderfully soft workable material. But if you need a, a very hard material for coins, God has given us nickel. If you need a very strong material, God has given us titanium. I've used that on Olympic bikes as well. If you want a conducting material, God has given us copper and magnet, iron, battery, lithium. If you speak to a top engineer and say, is there anything missing? Do you wish the world had another kind of metal with a different kind of property? And they will say, no, we have every kind of metal we need for every application. Some people have said, well, that's, a, that's another lucky coincidence. But it's not a coincidence. It's God's design, God's planning, God's goodness to man that he's thought of everything that we would ever do. By the way, that's the Olympic chain for Tokyo with the British Union Jack side plate, so everyone knows which team this, this chain belongs to. Um, copper is a really interesting uh, metal. It's very abundant. It's one of the most useful metals for man because it conducts electricity and it's also ideal for plumbing. And as well as having the right thermal properties, it just so happens that copper is um, a very safe, it, it's a very biocompatible um, uh, because it's got a naturally antibacterial material. It's incredible. The very metal that's ideal for plumbing just happens to have this antibacterial, really ideal for people. God thinking of every need. And we have abundant aluminium, iron, copper. The metals that we most need are most abundant in the earth. Then God has given us not just every metal, but every wood. There are thousands of types of tree in the world with a great range of properties, uh, which is of great use to carpenters and engineers and builders. We have every kind of wood uh, for every kind of need. There's nothing missing. If you want a fast growing wood, you, you have pine, very used extensively by builders, cheap and convenient. If you want a really strong wood, then God has given us oak. Apparently, English oak is even stronger than Irish um, oak. Um, if you want a really tough wood, then you uh, choose willow. Willow is an extraordinarily tough wood. It has a very special structure. And some people have said, you know, why, why do we have... A willow is so different to all these other trees. Most trees are not that tough wood, but willow can be almost indestructible. Why, why is there this willow tree? Well, of course, of course there's a willow tree, because without a willow tree, it would be hard to play cricket and baseball, <laughs> uh, because in cricket and baseball, you need a super tough uh, wood. Actually, God knew we also needed willow, willow for hammers, um, and sledgehammers and tools like that. Very, there are very few woods that are suitable for hammers, sledgehammers, and those kind of tools, and God knew that we needed this super tough wood. So there is an explanation to this extraordinary uh, wood called 
uh, willow. And of course, God was thinking of what more cricket than baseball when he was creating uh, willow. And okay, at the bottom of that list, uh, it has spruce, I think, which engineers call a musical wood. There are woods like uh, spruce, maple, rose, and they are called by engineers tonal woods or musical woods. What, why is that? Because out of thousands and thousands of trees, there's just a handful, just a few, that are perfectly designed to create musical instruments like cellos, violins. They have a very special structure that gives them a very special resonance. And it's yet another coincidence that the atheist says, aren't we lucky, this coincidence? There are trees designed for musical instruments. But of course, that is God's planning. God loves music. The Bible speaks of God singing. In Genesis 4, it speaks of him giving a gift of music to one of the first families, uh, the gift of music in flute and harp playing. And not only has God given us the gift of music, but he's, he's even created trees where we can build musical instruments. Uh, and, and, and you can even read scientific papers on the special... I've, I've co-written a book on the wonderful properties of wood uh, for all kinds of applications. Then we come to foods, and the Bible has quite a number of verses speaking of foods created for man. Right back in Genesis 1 and 2, God says he has created the fruit of the trees for man. The ability to appreciate food and enjoy food is a great challenge to atheists. Atheists are very confused. Why do we have thousands of taste buds to enjoy food? Because we didn't need that to survive. If we've just evolved from apes, why do we enjoy food? Why do we have these taste buds? But of course, this is exactly what you'd expect if God had created us. God wants us to enjoy pleasures. He wants us to enjoy the pleasure of food. And he's given us uh, different taste buds in different parts of the tongue to appreciate different types of taste. Even our sense of smell uh, contributes to our enjoyment of food. And God has created foods with different kinds of tastes uh, so that we can uh, really enjoy food. If you watch animals, they eat very fast. They eat to survive. They're not enjoying food. They're just eating food for survival, but humans are different. We enjoy uh, food. Food only makes sense if you see it as designed for mankind. Trees do not need to produce an abundance of fruit. An apple tree does not need to produce a 100 large, beautiful, tasty apples every year. It doesn't need to do that. The apples don't need to be so healthy and nutritious and delicious. doesn't make sense unless you believe God did it specifically for human use. I, uh, the food industry is quite a big, actually it's a very big industry for engineers. Millions of pounds go into the food industry. Engineers try and design uh, food, yogurts, flans, and so on. I can tell you that engineers are in awe of natural food like fruit and vegetables. And engineers are very humbled because they cannot get near the brilliant design of food. Anything engineers design is never as nutritious, never as tasty, never as long-lasting, never as well packaged. An engineer would love to produce something like a banana. But to undo a banana, you just, if it's ripe, you just pull the, the skin off. Engineers can never produce packaging like that. The banana tells you when it's ripe, it goes brown. Engineers can't do that. A banana has this lovely gooey softness and it's so nutritious. Engineers cannot copy that. They cannot copy what God has done. God has designed the perfect convenience food. Um, an apple is almost entirely moisture. It's like 99% juice. And yet when you take a bite from an apple, 
the juice doesn't come out because the apple is full of these tiny cells. Uh, you don't get a straw with an apple. You don't need a straw with an apple. But when an engineer produces a carton of fruit juice, he has to stick a straw on the side, which is a really difficult thing uh, to do when you're mass producing. Engineers would love to copy an apple, would love to copy those tiny cells, but it's too difficult. We cannot copy what God has done. God has even put oranges in segments, so you have a bite-sized segment uh, to eat. Sometimes people say to me, what are the greatest evidences of design? And I have kind of a long list to go through. The human voice is definitely one of the greatest evidences of design. But another one I like to put in is chocolate. You know, in, uh, they, I think they first came from South America. You had these cocoa beans, chocolate plants. Those bushes do not need chocolate. And people have said, you know, why did... Why does this plant produce cocoa, which is easy to turn into chocolate? It's because God knew we would like chocolate. God has given us coffee, tea, chocolate, every kind of food that we would enjoy and we would uh, need. Did you know that wheat and rice and maize and these other crops, they're types of grass. There are, there are over 10,000 types of grass in the world. Uh, God has given us this great range of grass for feeding cattle, for playing sports, but also for crops and cereals. And those crops, they only really make sense if you see them as designed for man. It's like this, you know, wheat, this big bundle of food on this stick. It doesn't, the plant doesn't need that. It's produced for human use. You see how we're giving this survey and I could, I could just go on forever, how God has designed every part of the world for human use with the right nutrition, the right abundance, easy to harvest. Uh, it, it shows God's goodness. Well, what is the greatest food? The greatest food is honey. It's a miracle food. Did you know that Honey is thought to be the only food in the world that you could live on. You can live on honey and water. There's firstly nothing else that can do that. And that is really remarkable because there are millions of types of insect. And the vast majority of insects have very simple food. They eat leaves, some eat dung. So insects have really, really basic food. So you have the vast majority of insects with very basic food. But then there's one insect, the honeybee, and it produces the most complex food on earth. So how can that be? That really confuses the atheist. All these insects have the most basic food, and then bees produce the most complex food on earth. If you wanted a proof of God, that is a proof. God designed the honeybee for human use. Absolutely. That was the first reason God created the honeybee. He wanted the first people to be able to enjoy that beautiful, sweet honey. Producing honey is so complicated. Not only does the bee have to collect that nectar through lots of complicated navigation, flying, collection, but when the, when the bee gets the nectar, it takes 20 minutes or so to digest, regurgitate, digest, regurgitate. Normally, it's not just one bee. He takes the nectar back, and it gets passed between maybe half a dozen bees, and they're digesting, regurgitating, to convert the nectar to glucose. And when it's converted to glucose, it's pure glucose. There's no cholesterol, no fat. It's the perfect sweet substance. Um, and it's thought to have medicinal properties. Do you know how many flower visits it takes to produce a jar of honey? And the reason for asking you the question is, I want you to think of how God has designed a bee to flap its wings 100 beats a second, and that is an incredible thing. Bees have dozens and dozens of muscles 
It's so complicated to design a bee. It's designed a bee to navigate to the flower, to collect tiny bits of nectar, and do all of those trips. And all that is so that honey can get on your table. That's the number one reason the bee flies, navigates, digests, regurgitates, produces honey. So how many? How many flower visits to create one jar of honey? The answer is two million. The next time you hold a jar of honey, just think to yourself, there were two million flower visits so that God could create this honey for me to eat and enjoy. Now, I made a mistake coming here because I wanted to give you a demonstration. And I normally ask someone to get a Valley of the Boyne jar of honey, uh, which I then take home with me afterwards. Um, it's, if you want really good honey, then Boyne Valley honey is one of the very best. I have some supermarket honey here. The problem with supermarket honey is they do cheat and they put a little uh, sugar cane. They really dilute it with things that are not honey. So beware of supermarket uh, honey. I actually come from a family of beekeepers. That's not too bad, but it's nowhere near as good as Boyne honey. Now, I just had a teaspoon of honey. That teaspoon had the lifetime work of 14 bees. The lifetime work of 14 bees. The next time you have toast with honey in the, mor in the morning, you have to remember that is the lifetime work of 14 bees. Just think of the work they did to create that honey and the work God did to create the bees to create that honey. Now, when you have a teaspoon of honey, you notice there's one drop left on that spoon. That is the lifetime work of one bee. So you cannot put that in the dishwasher. You have to lick it clean. <laughs> and if you lick it clean, then you have done justice to the lifetime work of one bee. How could you put that in the dishwasher? God has also designed animals for man. I mentioned uh, the horse. Without the horse, the whole history of the world would be different. We needed the horse for transportation. We needed the horse for warfare. Uh, apparently, horse polo goes back many centuries, if not uh, more than a thousand years. God knew that we needed horses for sport, for recreation, for transport, for farming, for plowing. We take it for granted today, but the horse is not a coincidence. That's one of God's best gifts to mankind. Horses enjoy working for man, and they even recognize a human uh, face. And there's just one other animal, uh, only one other animal, which is even more important than a horse. And that, of course, is the dog. The dog is an incredible gift that God has given to man. God knew that Adam and Eve needed uh, the dog. In the Garden of Eden, we read that there wasn't an animal uh, as good a companion as Adam needed, so wonderfully he created Eve, woman. But that doesn't mean the other animals were not companions. They were just not good enough. So God has given us creatures to be companions, particularly dogs and horses. Dogs love to work for humans. It, God has designed a dog that it derives great pleasure in helping uh, humans. Dogs have incredible herding, uh, herding abilities. If you've ever watched sheepdog working, they enjoy it and they're just fantastic at it. Dogs are also good for policing. There are powerful dogs uh, for pulling loads. And in recent times, uh, the usefulness of medical uh, assistant dogs in hospitals uh, is being recognized. I have one daughter who had a serious brain operation. When she woke up after her operation, she was sitting in, in, the, in the recovery ward right next to a mountain rescue dog. And the first thing she did was put her hand uh, around this dog, and it was a great uh, comfort. God has designed the dog for all 
of those things. Uh, then we could talk about uh, different materials that God has designed. Wool and cotton are amazing materials, very good at insulation and very comfortable materials as well because wool and cotton are, are very efficient at absorbing moisture like uh, sweat. Engineers have tried to produce their own kind of materials like polyester and every material that engineers have produced have been inferior to cotton and wool. If you wear a polyester shirt, it feels wet far sooner than if you're wearing a cotton shirt because a cotton shirt absorbs a lot of sweat much, much more than a polyester shirt. So you feel more comfortable in natural materials. They're designed by a creator, God, who we cannot uh, match for skill and wisdom. Uh, I mentioned cotton already. Remarkably, uh, if you ever go to America or India, you can see these cotton fields and you look at these plants and you think, hang on, this plant doesn't need cotton. You know, it does not need this cotton. Uh, it does help to, to disperse seeds because the wind catches the cotton, but there are lots of other ways that seeds could get dispersed. So the cotton only makes sense if you understand that God has designed it for human use. And God has designed these cotton plants and cotton fields to produce an abundance of cotton for mankind. And grass for mankind. Did you know engineers cannot make a single blade of grass? They, they cannot make a single blade of grass. We often hear how clever scientists are, how clever engineers are, how clever humans are. Actually, we're not very clever. We cannot create a blade of grass. Over the last hundred years, engineers have tried to make artificial grass. And they've claimed to be making more progress. The, the hardest thing with artificial grass is to make it soft because natural grass is incredibly soft. 75% moisture uh, you, you try to get in meadow grass for football pitches, rugby pitches. I used to play rugby myself and I would love to do a long range tackle. We would slide along the ground. You get green kneecaps, but you never got injured. Never got injured. It's the softest way to land. If you're on artificial grass, what happens? You get cut because artificial grass is like sandpaper. It's very rough. Despite 100 years and millions and millions of pounds, engineers cannot make soft artificial grass. About some time ago, uh, about 10 years ago in South Wales, a rugby team phoned up the local supplier of artificial grass and they said, I've heard you've got the latest 3G, 4G, whatever it was, the latest generation. And they said, yeah, they, yeah this, this is quite, this, yeah, we claim this is quite soft. So they played rugby on it and afterwards, it was on the BBC News, Merthyr rugby players burnt by Pontypridd 3G pitch. Half the team had to go to hospital because their knees were covered in blisters and blood after playing on engineered artificial grass. Isn't it humbling? We cannot make a blade of grass. One of the latest techniques on artificial pitches is you mix real grass with artificial grass and it has certain uh, advantages. But I can just see God looking down saying, that is cheating. You're using my uh, grass. If you said to an engineer, I want you to build this machine, this box, and in one end will go grass, and at the other end will come milk. An engineer will say, that's impossible. I, I, can't, I can't build a machine that turns grass to milk. We'll then just say, well, but that's a cow. God's created a cow. We cannot do what God has done. God even converts earth, you know, muddy earth, into grass and then and into milk. It's just astounding what God can do. And he did it. He created cattle for mankind. Uh, uh, in, in England, uh, a lot of dairy cows produce 20 liters of milk a day. I think in Ireland it's a bit more than 20 liters. To do that, 
has to drink a lot of water, a lot of grass. Each day, a cow would have to pump 10,000 pints of blood through the udder to produce that milk. So the next time you have a glass of milk, just think of all that blood going around uh, the udder. It's incredible what <coughs> God has designed. And yeah, we live in a modern age, don't we, where we just take these things for, for granted. We're not so close to the farms and what is uh, happening. Then number 10, this is the last one. God has created a beautiful planet. At my university, I teach aesthetics and beauty to engineers so they can produce beautiful uh, motor cars. And I say creation is the perfect reference for design because God has created a blue sky which contrasts with the green land. That's very deliberate. Uh, blue and green are restful colors. If the whole sky was red all day, that would raise the blood pressure. So God has designed the sky to be blue, the grass to be green. Green is the best background color for the beautiful, bright uh, flowers. Even wildflowers, uh, blue is an unusual color, which makes sense because if the sky is dominated by blue, that would, then, it's, then that's the, white, the right way around. So God has given us a perfect color scheme. He's given us um, this beautiful world to be inspired by and, and by the way, this biblical worldview that I'm talking about in past centuries, this was taught in schools. Sadly, you watch David Attenborough, um, and he doesn't even mention God. There's no acknowledgement of God. He doesn't mention any of the things that I've spoken about today. And do you know, he produced a program called The Perfect Planet. I stole his title for my talk, A Perfect Planet for Mankind. David Attenborough has a program called The Perfect Planet where he never mentions God once. How is it a perfect planet? And how can you not mention the designer of that perfect uh, planet? One of my favorite aspects of creation I've written in, in my book is birdsong. On the top line uh, is music by J.S. Bach. Uh, it has two phrases. They're linked by anticipation, one note, it has a time signature, a key signature. It starts on a key note. Top note is a key note. It ends with a major third with finality. If you have a degree in music, you can appreciate the music by J.S. Bach on that top line. On the bottom line is music by a blackbird. And it has every single aspect of musicality of the music by J.S. Bach. And the blackbird doesn't have a degree in music because it has two phrases. It starts on a keynote, it has a time signature, uh, and it has a key signature. The two phrases are linked by anticipation. It finishes with an inverted major third. And scientists have been absolutely astonished at the musicality of birdsong. They cannot understand where it came from. But we know where it came from. It came from God, the perfect musician who put music in bird song. So I've spent the last 10 years uh, working for Team GB and this, this next week we're trying to finish our uh, uh, last testing for the Paris Olympics. We were ranked first in Rio, we were ranked first in Tokyo, we're hoping to be ranked first for cycling in Paris if we can get everything uh, finished and, and right. But as I say, the hardest thing was getting the ergonomics perfect for the riders. But as an expert in ergonomics, when I look at the world, I see perfection in ergonomics. I can't see anything that wasn't designed for man. Of course, we live in a fallen world. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, there is death, disease, decay. But if you put those aspects of a fallen world to one side, you see a a world designed as a home for mankind. People are without excuse. Of course there is a creator. I've worked in academia for 30 years at Bristol and Cambridge in the United States. One of the biggest surprises I had working in academia is so many academics come up to me and they say, Stuart, I think you're right. Of course, there's overwhelming evidence for intelligent design but we're not allowed to talk about it. I can't talk to the press about it 
because we're, we're supposed to pretend everything just came here by chance. I don't meet many atheists in academia. Uh, most people are agnostic, and most people admit, of course, the evidence points to intelligent design. Sadly, our children and students are not told that. They're not told what academics actually believe. Sadly, humanists have got hold of the agenda. They've got hold of the, uh, the teaching that goes on in primary schools and secondary schools. When, when children are taught evolution and humanistic ideas, it has not come from scientists. It's come from humanist UK. It's come from humanist lobby groups. Another wonderful thing about a creation worldview, it helps you to understand our design. We stand upright on two legs in order to be stewards of creation. There are 4,000 mammals in the world. We are the only one that stands on two legs. God did not design any other animal that could stand up to us. We can be stewards because of the way we are designed. God has given us hands for skill. Uh, he's, he's given us a thinking mind Animals follow their instinct, but we have powers of choice. Every, every second we're thinking, or, or, or we have the choice of what to do, what to say, what to think. But it's because of that powers of choice that we sin, we step on other people's toes, we displease uh, God. It's a wonderful gift that God has given us, that power of choice, but it does make us responsible beings in that um, in that chapter of Isaiah, it goes on to say, look to me, all the earth, and be saved. God is not just being good in giving us everything we need in this earth as a wonderful home, but he's even given us a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a designer salvation, a perfect salvation. Even though we do fall short, we, because of our powers of choice, we make wrong choices all of us every day we fall short of God's glory and yet we can be saved from our sins and have a hope of eternity in heaven if we put our trust in the creator himself the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins on the cross of Calvary uh, and, and my hope is that you'll know not just uh, God's goodness in creation but also his wonderful grace in salvation if you're interested in knowing more details about God's design in the world, uh, I have a book, Wonders of Creation, which, uh, which is outside. I just want to mention the, the latest book I've produced just in the last couple of months. I wrote it with uh, my daughter, and it's called The Gift of Sport. There aren't many books uh, written by Christians on sport, um, so I thought I would, I would write one because I really love sports myself. And it's meant to be a kind of evangelistic uh, book showing people that God wants us to enjoy things, including he wants us to enjoy sport. And sport reveals the wonder of the human body. It shows the wonder of God's goodness in giving us these capabilities. And it has the testimony of Christians at the back. It's a wonderful gift uh, for other people, especially those who enjoy sports. So do have a look at that afterwards. But I hope you're encouraged by those things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Burgess. That was a great talk. How wonderful it is to actually be focused and see and even in the very smallest thing of how the honey bee can make honey to put on our table, how amazing is that to think that God created that? And as um, Professor Burgess has said to us, um, somebody's pointing to me at the back, but I can't actually see that far. Um, how amazing is that? And how amazing is God's grace to us too? Um, so this morning, if you have any questions, uh, I know that the answers in Genesis team are going to be milling around, so do feel free to have a chat with them. Um, and there are some books here, I think, that they're... Thank you, Karen. So just to explain, thanks for dropping me in it, Professor Burgess. Appreciate that. Um, my name's Neil, and um, I've just been up with your wonderful children. Uh, and we've also brought a lot of resources out there. Of course, The Gift of Sport, which I would heartily recommend. Normally, it's £25. We do it on offer on tour for £20. But also, as you alluded to 
the wonders of creation, that's where you'd learn the most about what you've heard today. Okay, um, and great double page spreads um, in the book. And the idea is this is our best selling ever coffee table book. And the idea is you invite people over to your home, you leave this lying around, right? particularly if they are not Christians or atheists or whatever they are, leave it lying around, take their coffee order, go into the kitchen, make their coffee or tea and watch them have a look at it. But of course they can't take that home because it's expensive, even at 20 pounds, but we will give you this version for free which is just a pound, is it true the evidence for creation? And that, again, has the gospel message in the back. So drag them in with that one and send them away with that one. Okay, so that's a possibility. Also, Professor Burgess has written a number of other books as well, and we have them on special offer uh, collectively. So I'm going to tell you about four, um, but it's any three for £20. You can buy them individually, priced is on the back, but you can have any three for £20. There's hallmarks of design there. Um, did, did you tell them that Prince Charles has read this? King Charles has read this? He didn't, and he referred to it in a lecture. Oh, you'll have to ask Professor Burgess about that one. Um, design and origin of man is also there. Unique uh, traits uh, that God gave us that he gave to no other creation. He made the stars also, which has a section on the search for t- extraterrestrial life. And also something slightly different. I mean, it says it's by Stuart Burgess, but I think it was by Mrs. Burgess. Uh, God's way for romance, getting back to biblical courtship. I can tell you, um, when I read this, I'd already been married for 20 years. And I wish, I wish I could go back in time and give this to myself. So instead, I gave it to my two teenage sons. Um, (laughs) Just to let you know, also, we have answers. Answers in Genesis, right? Uh, New Answers book. By the way, I don't know if you follow us on Facebook, Answers in Genesis UK. So it's AIG.UKE on Facebook. We decided on our ferry trip over here to take a photo of me and our little um, robot mascot called Orbit. Just holding that, the caption simply said, educational reading on the ferry. It's gone viral. This one image of me and a stuffed toy holding one book It's now had over 400 likes, uh, and the comments have gone ballistic, and there's people having a right old go at us, and then there are other people responding to them, right? How would you respond to attacks on your faith? Be equipped. There's book one there that's 12 pounds, but guess what? There's more answers to more questions, because people always have questions. And if they're not coming to you for answers, they'll go somewhere else. It's called Google. So be equipped, £12 each, or book one, book two, book book three, and book four for £35. We also had the children's versions, which are allowed for parents too. All right, answers books for kids. I want to test you. I want to test you. Question, the serpent talked to Eve. So why can't snakes talk today? From Jemima, age 10, actually from Northern Ireland. One simple question, how would you answer that? Would you be able to answer it that succinctly with Bible verses? If not, you need these books. Six pounds each or all eight for, I think it's 35 pounds again. And finally, for the squeaky voice generation, we have answers books for teens as well. Uh, 10 pounds each or both for 16 pounds. I'll leave you with this. The seven seas of history is our framework for biblical history. Ask your kids about it when they come down from Sunday school. Hopefully, they might remember even just one or two of them. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm just going to hand over now to Andy and the team to lead us in worship. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations
taking care of every detail in our lives, every detail for our lives. Lord, we are in awe of you. How can we not respond to you, seeing all that you've done? So Father, thank you for this morning. 
I give her spirit for Neil, for their ministry, for the work that they're doing. I ask you to bless them. Bless them abundantly, Father. Open many, 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 many new doors for them. Send them right across this nation, even the world. Open doors that people would hear these truths. These amazing truths. So, Father, thank you for this morning. We ask you for your blessing as we part. And when we go armed with new inspirational information that we can share with those we come in contact with. For your glory and your glory alone, Father. And everybody said, Amen. Show our appreciation again to Stuart and to Neil. Thank you so much. Um, our prayer team are willing and ready in this side, so your right-hand side. Our coffee team are ready and willing on your left-hand side. Have a great morning. Please go. The prayer team will be there to help you. And stay around, have a chat. The bookstore is out in the coffee shop. And have a great Sunday. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. God bless. Take care.